Okay, so I think we can get started. We'll just admit people along the way here. Um, welcome again to tonight's program, Transit After Hours Drawn on the Way. Just a couple of quick things before we get started. Um, we have closed captioning enabled for tonight's program. So if you would like to turn that on, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can then read the words that we're all saying as the program goes along tonight. Uh, we are also recording this program. Um, so if you say anything or if you have your camera turned on, uh, just know that you'll also be part of the recording. Um, we do invite you to turn on your camera if that's something you're comfortable with so we can all see each other and be part of the group together this evening. Um, but please keep your microphone muted until the end of the program when we'll have time for a Q&A session with Sarah. So um, now I'm very excited to introduce Sarah, who is our guest uh, presenter this evening. Sarah Nisbet is a former professional opera singer who learned how to draw by sketching strangers during her daily commute on the New York City subway. She's a totally self-taught artist. She's drawn over 5,000 strangers and turned her hobby of drawing on the, on the way into a successful illustration career, Instagram account, blog, and book. Her Drawn on the Way drawing project is dedicated to helping people find the extraordinary in the everyday and see themselves and those around them as works of art. Um, we're so happy to have her here sharing her project with us. Uh, we'll hear a little bit about her, her start, her past, her experience, and then we'll also have a little bit of time for sketching all together. So if you have a pen and a paper nearby, um, you can join us in that part of the program as well. So now I will stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to you, Sarah. Awesome. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here as well. Give me one second to get this settled. All right. And hopefully you can see my slides now. Looking good? Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Sarah Nisbet, and as you said, I'm a self-taught artist, author, and the founder of the Drawn on the Way project. And just a quick reintroduction to that project. Uh, Drawn on the Way is a project that I started accidentally on the New York City subway about 10 years ago. Uh, and it's a collection of sketches drawn live in the moment, as you said, that celebrates the people, places, and things we often overlook in the rush of our day-to-day -day lives. And the mission of this project is to use illustration to connect people with their world and inspire people to find the extraordinary in the everyday and to see themselves and others as a work of art. And tonight, uh, I'm going to share with you some of the most important things I've learned from this project and from drawing on the train. And then we're going to take a moment, as you said, to do some drawing together so that you can see how easy it is to begin to turn your world into a work of art while you're on the way and hopefully find more connection in your day as you do. So first, um, let me tell you how the project started. Um, it, it started accidentally. <laughs> um, and uh, when I was commuting home on the train one night uh, uh, in 2012, I moved to New York to be a, an opera singer, which I did for, for many years, pretty successfully. And um, at a certain point I decided I wanted to transition into a kind of more traditional nine to five job. And so it was during that time that I found myself working as a temp. Um, so kind of anonymous face in an anonymous place every day. Um, and I found myself commuting home one night from work on the train and I just could not look at a screen for one more second of the day. And so I thought, all right, what else can I do to pass the time on the way home? And I, I pulled my sketchbook, I had a little notebook with me at the time, pulled it out of my purse and dug around until I found um, a, a stolen office pen from the supply closet. Shh, don't tell them. Uh, and, um, and I thought I'd just doodle something because that's what I always did. And I, I, I thought of something to doodle and just nothing came to mind. And so I thought, okay, let me, let me look around, let me, let me look around and see what I see. And at that time, I had never tried to draw anyone from real life. In fact, I knew two things. I knew I could not draw people and I could not draw anything from real life. But I found myself looking for looking for inspiration. And so I started looking around and I saw this older gentleman 
80 years old if he was a day, wearing a brown three-piece leisure suit with a vest and a wide pattern tie and a fedora and heading into the city when everyone else was heading home for the night. And I just thought, who, who is this guy? You know, and it just had such a like New York story. Like, who is this person? And I started wondering about him and wondering, you know, who was he when that suit was new and, and who is he now? And as I started wondering about him, I started drawing him. And when I finished, I, I looked at my drawing and I thought two things. I thought, that's, that's better than I thought it was going to be. And, and then the other thought was, oh my God, I'm home. And so it had really helped pass the time. So the next morning I, I got on the train and I drew the person across from me. And I did it that night on the way home too. And I have done it every single day since then, uh, drawing somewhere, somebody. And um, I often say that, you know, the subway in that process taught me how to draw. But more importantly, it taught me how to see. And it taught me how to bring the background of our lives into the foreground and how to see the stories that surround us. And that brings me to one of the first lessons that drawing on the subway taught me. So look up. <laughs> um, as New Yorkers, we're, we're sort of trained to be anonymous out in public, especially when we're on the subway. And I saw people and I still see people, you know, checking out in so many ways, hiding behind books, lost in cell phones and tuning out with their headphones in. And in a strange way, the more tuned out people were, the easier it was for me to tune in because they didn't notice me noticing them. And in noticing them, my ride became way more interesting. And I began to notice the little details, you know, the silent ways that people talk about themselves to the world. So it might be the, the funky socks on a seemingly straight laced banker or, you know, a, a, a statement patch that somebody's wearing. I don't know if you can see on this slide, but it says, good morning, New York, let's make that money, <laughs> which I just thought was like so perfect and so, so New York. Um, or, you know, it might be the way that somebody reveals their profession because they're, they're carrying it with them as the case of our, of our cellist here. Um, you know, and it's not just the way we style ourselves that reveals something about who we are. And I began to see that the way a person holds themselves says something about who they are too. You know, the, the shy way somebody tucks their feet under the bench or the elegant regal way somebody drapes their hand over their purse. You know, it's such a small gesture, but doesn't it really speak to who this person is or to who they might be. And, and I say who they might be because, because these stories are speculation. So, so they could be wrong, you know, but, but wondering about the people you share this city with has a profound effect, especially now when, when we can only see, you know, half of someone's face and there's this real sense of, of disconnect and, and isolation. It's more important than ever to look up uh, and be curious about the people we share our world with. And that's because when we become curious about the people around us, we wonder about them. And we begin to imagine the lives and stories happening outside of our own. And that is the definition of empathy. Empathy is the action of, of understanding. You, you attempt to experience and inhabit the emotions of someone else, and that creates connection. So when you wonder about someone, you become connected to them. And these drawings are a tool to focus our curiosity and, and inspire wonder. And in doing so, even if I never spoke to the person I drew, I, I feel connected to them. And so that first drawing was the beginning of a new way of looking for me. You know, using, using drawing as a way of tapping into the world around me. So these aren't just sketches, they're, they're stories about the people I share my journey with, jotted down in lines of ink instead of text. And, and by noticing the moments, the little moments that happen along the way, you also begin living in them. And that makes the literal and metaphorical journey much more interesting. Uh, and I might not have discovered any of this, if I hadn't started drawing on the subway, because the subway is actually a really wonderful teacher. Um, <laughs> I always say that time 
repetition and mistakes are your best teachers. And as a self-taught artist, I'm a big believer in this. And the subway actually offers those in spades. Uh, so first of all, the gift of time, uh, both too much and not enough. <laughs> um, so I lived off the F train for most of my New York life, uh, which is famous, at least in my mind, uh, for being late or delayed or, or both. Um, and this isn't great for, for commuting, but it is great if you're using the train as, as a kind of art school. So with my sketchbook in hand, the hours spent waiting on platforms, and I'm thinking specifically of J Street Metro Tech, that cross-track cross, cross track transfer from the AC to the F. I spent a lot of my life there. <laughs> um, but you know, those hours spent waiting on platforms or, or stuck underground between, you know, somewhere between Manhattan and Brooklyn weren't, weren't wasted time. They just extended my class time. And, and similarly, you, you also don't have a lot of time to draw on the train because you, you don't know when the person across from you is, is getting off uh, and, and you don't know where they're, they're leaving. So you don't know how much time you have. And that, that taught me that you can express a lot with a little. And of course, you get a lot of repetition on the train um, because drawing was linked to my daily routine. Getting practice was, was honestly easy to the point of being unavoidable. So my commute was my default time to practice. And, you know, with, I think there's like five and a half million people that ride the train every day in a normal day. Uh, I had, I had infinite opportunities to practice again and again until that constant repetition gave way to the beginnings of skill and drawing from life gave me this inexhaustible source of inspiration, along with the confidence that if at first I don't succeed, I will have to try again on the way home. <laughs> and that brings me to another important lesson the subway taught me, is a bumpy ride. <laughs> um, so I've made over, I think at this point, 5,000 portraits with just an ordinary office pen. And I am so glad that I pulled that pen out of my purse on that first commute, because it taught me along with the bumpy ride of the train to, to really embrace my mistakes. Because without an eraser, each line really becomes an act of, of bravery. And without an eraser, there's, there's no going back. So when it comes to the work at hand, there are only three choices. You can accept what you've made as good and move on. You can turn the page and start over or you can work with your mistakes and turn them into something you like. And you know, these are the constraints of, of working in pen, but it doesn't take much to sort of imagine that these, these really mirror the choices that we have at any given moment in life, right? And you know, this sort of forced boldness of using pen helped me to see that mistakes are, are really opportunities for discovery and, and innovation. And I want to tell you a story um, of one of my favorite drawings that, that really represents that idea and, and that, that drawing is here. Um, I was going to work one morning and I was drawing this woman across from me. She had this just like perfectly coiffed bob and she was so elegant and I had managed to draw it in just like, you know, the most minimum amount of lines and I was so proud of myself and I was feeling like a very fancy artist for not having had coffee. And, <laughs> and I was just about to put the last line in and I watched my hand just kind of like, you know, screech across the page and I'm like, what just happened? And the, the person in getting into their seat next to me had bumped my arm. And my first thought was like, ah, excuse me, you're in my studio, <laughs> like how dare? And then my second thought was, um, you're on the subway and this is not a studio and that's, you, you know that that's what happens. And I kind of looked at the drawing and I was like, oh, it's ruined, you know, like, and I don't have time to, to fix it because I'm almost at work, it's my stop. And, you know, and moreover, I don't want to, like don't, this drawing was, it was what I wanted. I don't want to start again. And so I looked at the drawing and I just thought, how can I, how can I work with this? And so I started, you know, drawing in more lines to, to kind of, make that hairstyle. So I, I drew another jagged line in and another one and another one until I sort of had this eclectic electric little tangle of lines that you see here to make her hair. And at the end, I had a different drawing than the one I planned, but one that I actually liked a lot better. This really is one of my favorite drawings, um, both for the story and for the drawing itself. 
And I, I started using this technique <laughs> to draw hair whenever I could. And I looked for any opportunity to draw patterns and stripes with lines that kind of took that same sort of imperfect route across the page. And so this drawing is, is a mistake, yes. But working with that mistake taught me so much. And, you know, and that's just it, you know, the, the more you fail, the more you realize that mistakes are instructional and, and not fatal. <laughs> and I always tell people to, to draw in pen because it means you have to be bold and confident, even if you aren't feeling that way. And practicing that day in and day out really does have an effect on the rest of your life. And that actually brings me to my next great lesson, the subway and this project taught me. You gotta enjoy the ride. <laughs> So after, after a few weeks of drawing on the subway, I was hooked. I would, I would step on the train and I'd, I'd reach for my sketchbook, uncap my pen and kind of let my eyes wander over the crowd. And it was, it was really reflexive and it was, it was my favorite part of the day. But things soon changed from, from pure joy to a mix of emotions. And I loved how I felt when I was drawing, but when I stopped to look at what I had drawn, I, I didn't feel so great. Here's some examples of some of my earlier works. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I thought when I first started drawing that the only worthwhile way to recreate the world was to do it with, with perfect fidelity. And I was disappointed in my, you know, wobbly lines and, and scratchy sketches and almost to the point where I was ready to give up. And that is when I had to figure out how to follow the joy. So, so one day I, I was drawing and I was feeling really frustrated by my sketch. And I had this sort of epiphany, which prompted me to say to myself, you know, you're an art history major, right? So you know that art isn't about perfectly recreating what you see. You know, we celebrate Da Vinci and Picasso and Van Gogh because they recreated the world as, as they saw it. Um, and if you do the same, aren't you kind of following in the footsteps of the greatest artists? So from that moment on, I, I decided that maybe I was the next Picasso. And, and what was the worst, the worst thing that was going to happen if I treated my work as if I was? And, and so instead of stopping in that moment, I started focusing on expressing a view of the world as, as I saw it. So a drawing was good if I felt good making it. And a drawing was good if it made me feel the way I felt when I looked at that person. Um, and a drawing was good, you know, if I told somebody's story. So, you know, it's, it's important to, to uncouple the product from the process and, and really redefine what good art is. Because once I realized that I could evaluate my work by the joy of making it, I, I was free, you know, and not, not evaluated by, by how good it was, but by the joy. Because um, making art feels good, so <laughs> enjoy it, you know? And if I let my inner critic tell me to stop in that moment, I wouldn't be here right now talking to you. But more importantly, I, I would have robbed myself of years of, of that kind of joyful connection. And, and that joyful connection brings me to my final lesson to, to share about this product, project. So never miss a connection. Um, when I can, I gift my sketches to the person I've drawn. And I find that this, this small act of sharing really counters the anonymity of the city and, and really anywhere in such a profound way. Um, you know, sharing really multiplies the joy of creating. And if you share, you'll see the power of, of what you've made, which is a version of the world that has the ability to delight or move and inspire. And I promise that no matter what your drawings look like, um, this is true, they, they have that power. And, and here's just one final story to illustrate that point. Um, so I don't often get to hear what happens to my portraits when I, when I give them away, but this particular story I did learn um, and it reminds me why our job as visual storytellers is so important. Um, so I was riding the, the train home one rainy night and if you have ever ridden the New York City subway on a rainy day, it is. <laughs> It's kind of, it's a particular kind of misery. It's, it's soggy and it's humid and everybody kind of looks like and feels like a drowned rat. And um, I was no exception that day. And I was on the train and I started looking around for, for somebody to draw. And in this sort of like sea of shared misery, <laughs> I saw this woman 
um, wearing a fedora and just looking um, just peaceful and just sort of, you know, at ease. Um, and so I, I drew her and I, I got a chance to give the drawing to her and I scratched my, my name, my email address on a little card and, and handed it to her. And um, uh, months, months later, I heard from her. Um, and so at the time when I would share my drawings, I would just share them with a title. I wouldn't add any caption on Instagram and just share a title that I made up. And for this particular drawing, I titled it Weather the Storm because that's, that's what I saw her doing. And um, so I get this email months later and she reached out to say that on the day that I drew her, she was having a, a pretty bad day in the middle of a pretty bad week, in the middle of a pretty bad month. And that this, this drawing and the title that I gave it had been a very needed confidence booster. Um, and, and she also shared, and these are her words, and I, I share them because I, I think I, I wanna communicate this idea that what she said is, it was one of those small gestures that really restores your faith in humanity. And, and that is the power that these little drawings, and we're gonna practice doing some of that today, but that is the power that these, these have. And you know, her, her experience in that moment and my imagined story were different, right? But there was a truth to what I saw. And I saw someone weathering the storm with, with grace and elegance, even though in that moment, she felt battered by it. And by sharing that image with her, it reminded her of a truth about herself. And that, that you know, profound moment of connection and joy stays, stays with me to this day. Um, and so, you know, the, the joy of observational drawing, which we are gonna practice uh, in just a few minutes here, is that it transforms everyday moments into something more. So we often, you know, get so fixated on getting where we're going that we, we think of all the steps to get there as lost time. But truly these on the, on the way moments are the stuff of life. And you know, how many hours of your life have you spent on the subway or in transit or these days, you know, sitting at your desk with, you know, five minutes until your next meeting starts. And, and how many of those hours were you impatiently biding your time, you know, racing to get to the next thing. And imagine how different that time could be if you tuned into the world around you. And if you allow yourself to be present, you will, you will see the world come alive with thousands of stories every day. So we are always in transit and on the way is not a place, it's an ever shifting point from which we begin again and again. And there's, there's always another page to turn and new chapters to write and sketchbooks to fill. So it's worth taking a brief pause to enjoy the view. And that is what we're all going to do together because we're gonna do some drawing now. <laughs> um, so now that you know a little bit more about how drawing from life could change your life, um, I thought we could do some drawing together to practice that, try it out. Um, so you should have a pen or pencil and a few sheets of paper to join in on this part. If you, if you don't have that um, handy, you can, you can take a minute to go find those now and I will keep chatting. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do today is, is we're going to find ways to get creative without inviting that uh, aforementioned inner critic along for the ride. So today we are not going to use our erasers at all because we are not worried about making mistakes. We're just gonna go with the flow. And for our first drawing today to practice focusing on the process, we're going to draw without looking at the page. So that might sound a little scary, but I promise it's fun. Um, <laughs> this kind of drawing is called uh, a blind contour drawing. And so to make sure we really don't peek, um, that we do this blind, quote unquote, uh, we're going to make what I call a shield of creative faith to protect us from our own judgment. Because if we can't see what we're doing, then we can't judge what we're doing. Um, so to make this um, shield of creative faith, you're going to take a piece of paper. So if you're using a sketchbook, just tear it out. If you're using loose paper, you're all set. Um, it's a very, very fancy, very technical thing that we're about to make. You're going to stab <laughs> your pen or pencil through your paper so that it looks like this. 
Um, I can see a few people, people's uh, screens, so if you, if you, once you've got your ma yours made, you can hold it up, and I'll know you've, you've got it. Um, but it should look something like this, and as you can see, if I tried to um, draw uh, below this, I would not be able to see what I'm doing. So yes, I see some people holding theirs up. Thank you. Um, those look great, and um, you are looking ready. So you can go ahead and, and set that aside for just one second. Um, because I thought before we, we uh, make a blind contour drawing, I should probably first just tell you what a contour drawing is. Um, so on the screen here, I've got a couple examples of contour drawings. Um, a contour drawing is just a technique that focuses on outlining the shape uh, or contours of the object. So in this technique, you don't add minute details or shading. Instead, you just focus on capturing the general exterior shape of your object and maybe a few details from the inside. So you can see here I've got this lovely paintbrush. Um, here is our, our, our original inspiration here. Um, so you can see that I've just made a, a simple outline of the shape. And then um, I've, I've also added little bits of um, details or contours where the sort of topography changes on the object itself. So like here where I've got, you know, the ridges um, where the, the brush is clamped onto the handle or the ridges of the bristle, there I've added those little contours um, or topographies onto my drawing. So uh, very, very simple. And um, on the right hand side there, you've got some contour drawings of books, which are just rectangles. That's the shape of a book. So that's our contour drawing. <laughs> um, and I have added some titles there just for fun, because that is fun for me. <laughs> and so it's, it's a very, very simple technique. Um, and to make a contour drawing, if uh, just a quick way to think about doing it is if you ever made a tracing of your own hand, um, like maybe back in elementary school, and you sort of, um, you know, drew the outline of its shape by just sort of physically running your pen around each side of the finger and around your palm. Um, you do the same thing to make a contour drawing, but instead of physically tracing your pen, you, you uh, use your eyes to, to take that same route and you map the path that they take using your pen. Um, and again, you can see here, I've added some, some interior contours like the ridges of the nails or um, the knuckles, but you don't even have to do that. Um, another way to just think about how to quickly do this is if you're, if you're making a contour drawing, just imagine like an ant crawling around the outside of your object and you would just trace the path that that ant took to, to draw that object. Um, so these are very, very simple drawings that we're going to practice. Um, and they, they look and seem simple, and they are, but the skills required to make these drawings are the foundation of almost every artistic discipline from sculpture to painting and everything in between. So this is because to make a contour drawing, uh, you practice turning observation into art and connecting your hand to your eye. So for these first blind contour drawings that we're going to do, they are going to be wonky, and that's okay. This is an example of one that I made a while ago that I decided to paint because I actually liked how it turned out, but they're, they're wonky, they're funky, and, and that's okay because we're using these to really bypass the critical control center of the brain and practice getting oriented on the page and letting our hand lead the way. Because when you're drawing, I think you should let your head follow your hand and your hand follow your heart. So we're going to practice that first part of that idea in, by making us sort of tap into our instincts and, and focus on removing judgment. These, these blind contour drawings are going to help us really focus on the process and not the product and really let our instincts lead the way. So we are all going to draw the same thing one of these two choices um, for this first drawing. So you can go ahead and grab your shield of creative faith. Um, I'm going to just give you two quick tips. Uh, one is that you can kind of use your line to orient yourself on the page if you sort of draw in one continuous line. So what I mean by that is um, if you're drawing this dog, this lovely poodle, um, you would draw the tail and work your way towards the head and the nose and the chest rather than like starting at the tail and jumping right to the head. So you can kind of use your line as almost like a trail of breadcrumbs to kind of understand where you've been and where you're going, since you can't see. Um, you can kind of feel that. And then as you're working sort of section by section like that, you can add the little details in. So again, if you get to that head section, you can kind of jump in and try and draw, you know, the ear and the eye and all that good stuff. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple minutes to draw these, uh, one of these lovely um, items. And if you get done early, you can start drawing the other one. 
And I'm gonna put that timer on now and I'm gonna chat to you guys a little bit while you draw and you can feel free to listen or just enjoy your drawing time and sort of tune me out. <laughs> um, so as you're drawing here, um, again, just kind of focusing on, on that object and just do your best. Don't worry that you can't see it. Just enjoy this kind of seeing what you come up with. Um, and as you're drawing, I will just share another sort of technique that I use to kind of disinvite that inner critic from the creative process. So I, I use, I, one day I was on the train and I was having a, a inner critic fit and I came up with this sort of practice to silence it, which is that I, I sort of treat my inner critic um, like a naughty child. So if it starts up and it starts saying things like, oh, you don't even know how to, you know, you didn't go to art school or that doesn't even look like that person. Um, I sort of respond to it and just say, if you can't be nice today, then we don't get to draw. And I'm just gonna close the sketchbook and you can just ride in silence. And, and usually that is enough to kind of quiet it down. Um, but there are some days where it is really insistent. And on those days, I actually will advise you if you can to just, to just not push because your creativity is such a precious, precious thing. And you don't wanna let it be contaminated with things like your inner critic or outer critics. So this is just sort of be that protective parent to that part of yourself that is brave enough and fun enough to try this. Um, so you've got about 30 seconds now to finish these drawings up or to try the other one if you want. Um, I think you're probably seeing by now you can actually get a lot done in a little bit of time. So I'll let you finish these drawings in a bit of silence as much as I can manage. All right, and that is our blind contour drawing time. I already see some wonderful folks sharing their drawings. So if everyone would be so uh, game for it, we can just hold your, your drawings up to the camera while I'll do it at the same time. I will share, this is one I made yesterday. Uh, <laughs> love, I love these, these are great. These are fabulous. I've, I love it, I love it. These are great, I love it and I, I I love it. Everyone did a great job from what I can see. These are fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing this. So I want to ask, and you guys can answer this in the comments. Um, I wonder if, you know, that felt a little scary for, you know, if you kind of wanted to peek if, or if you did, um, you can just like drop a little heart in the comments or, or raise your hand. I can see for folks who've got cameras on, we can do it that way. Um, so kind of ask yourself that. And then also, uh, did you, did you kind of enjoy not being able to see what you were doing? And you can answer yes to, to both of these questions <laughs> um, publicly or just in your mind. Um, so, so the idea is that with these blind contour drawings, which are great, great warm up, um, or just if you're stuck and you just need to kind of get out of your head, um, they help us really learn to evaluate our work in a new way. So instead of focusing on, on the end product and perfection, we're kind of, we're learning to evaluate our work by joy and, and not excellence. And usually that leads to a better result anyway. So now our next little exercise here, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on the second part of that expression. So how to let your hand follow your heart. And for this part, we're gonna let our emotions guide our creative process and, and help us tap into those stories that surround us. Because there's so many different ways to enter the process of creativity. We just practice kind of going in through instinct and now we're gonna practice going in through the door of, of emotion. And as in a way to kind of avoid going in through the doorway of perfectionism, which is never very fun to, to walk through. Um, so for this exercise, um, I want you to pick an object in your house somewhere nearby um, that has a story or has that has meaning to you. So something where when you see it right away, you're like, I remember the story of that. Um, and make sure it's close enough that uh, to you that you can see well enough to draw it. If you need to get closer to it or bring it to you, that's fine. Um, you can go look for that now. I'm, I'm gonna keep talking. Um, so the object could be something small, like a mug, like your favorite mug or your least favorite mug, um, or it could be something big with a lot of meaning. So it could be your partner or your pet. Any of those things are great. Um, and 
So while you're looking for that, I'll explain a little bit more how we can kind of connect to our creativity through emotion. So we've all been stuck at home a lot <laughs> and things are probably looking pretty familiar and a little bit dull at this point. So we're gonna fix that by looking in a new way for this exercise, by observing. So observation allows us not just to look, but to see things anew. Um, and we're gonna use our contour drawing to sort of assist in this deeper observation process. So we're gonna look at things with the mind to see the stories and the feelings within them. And our drawings will literally help to draw those out. So, you know, we'll, we'll draw out those feelings that our objects have. And, and um, you know, what, what do I mean by that? I just said a sort of weird thing. I said, objects have feelings. Um, so, you know, can a, can a clock be sad or can a teacup be joyful? or, you know, can a shoe be sassy? Um, science has, has yet to prove the <laughs> deep emotional lives of the objects that surround us, but, you know, it's undeniable that we as humans have emotional reactions to the things that surround us. So, you know, a clock can be sad if you're waiting for someone to come home, or, you know, a teacup can be joyful if it brings you joy, or a shoe can be sassy if it makes you feel that way. So when I say objects have feelings, this is what I really mean, is that objects may not possess emotions, but they can certainly reflect them. So, so it's worth taking the time to contemplate something as simple as a clock or a shoe or a flower for what it might reveal. And so that is what we're going to do now. So hopefully you've got something to draw and you're welcome to look at your page while we do this exercise. Um, you're also very welcome to keep using your shield of creative faith. Um, and I'm going to give us uh, a little more time for this drawing. And before we before we get started on that, um, I'll say that for this drawing, we're, we are going to be really focusing on on that feeling and emotion. So and we're going to be translating that into the gesture that we use to make these drawings. Um, so that you know, that sense of gesture is sort of how we, we put that feeling into the way that we make our drawing. So what does something, you know, soft and fluffy feel like to draw? What does something angular or hard or tough feel like? You know, are you drawing polka dots or pattern? You know, how does that feel or how does texture feel? So you're gonna imbue in this drawing, you're gonna imbue that feeling into the gestures that you make. Um, and you know, the same goes for emotion. So what does a joyful line feel like to make or a sad line? You know, if your story is sad or makes you kind of sad or what does a silly line feel like to make? Um, and so as you draw, really think about these feelings and stories and sort of put them into your line and have fun. And like, you can make, I'm going to put four minutes on the clock here. So you can probably have time to make a couple drawings or, or have as many as you like. Um, but really get loose and have fun and focus on that gesture. So I'm going to put four minutes on the clock here. Um, and we are going to do a little drawing. Um, and, uh, so while you draw, um, I'm going to just chat to you for a few minutes. I see that we're getting kind of close on time here. So I'm, I'm going to challenge you guys to do these drawings in, let's say like two minutes. <laughs> um, you can keep drawing while I'm, while I'm talking. Um, so, so some of the benefits of, of doing this kind of creative meditation that we're doing right now is, is exactly that it's by sort of tapping into the now, like you are looking at your object, you're thinking about what it's made of. You're seeing those details maybe some for the first time, maybe some for the hundredth time, but you are deeply, deeply in the now. And the now is a great place to be as an antidote to anxiety and stress because anxiety is a super future oriented mental state. What will happen? How will things turn out? Will it be okay? And so anything that we can do to bring us into the now keeps us there which is a natural antidote to that kind of stress that I think a lot of us have, have probably gotten pretty used to, to living with these days. And another sort of benefit, again, of this very simple drawing that you're doing is you're just focusing into those stories and the emotion and the memories that are, are held in these things in our world is you are recreating your world in a way that makes sense to you. So you're sort of organizing the data of your world and the chaos into a way that makes sense as you try to recreate it. And that is something that our brains love. We are, we are super um, 
built to to want that kind of order and storytelling. Um, and as a matter of fact, stories are how we one of the ways that we create that organization for ourselves. So even in this very simple, you know, drawing that you're doing, focusing on the feelings of your object and the story within it, you are getting all of these benefits and in just a couple minutes, which is kind of amazing. So speaking of time, you've got about, I'll be generous, I'll say another 30, 30 seconds here. <laughs> um, and uh, you can finish up your drawing now. If, you, if you're looking, go ahead and see if there's any last things that will sort of complete that story for you. If you're not looking, I commend you. I uh, hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> And um, again, you can kind of start holding up your drawing as you as you finish it to the camera. I, I love to see. I can, I'll try and react to as many as I can see, but I have a limited sort of scope here. Oh, I see some fabulous ones coming up. I love it. These are great. These are awesome. <laughs> I always love seeing what, what people are inspired by in their house. These are fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Um, and as you guys are kind of sharing with each other, um, I wanna, I wanna just ask you, and again, you can answer this in your own mind or, or in the comments if you want. Um, you know, did you notice something new about your object while you're drawing it? You know, was there some detail or some element of the story that, you know, just in those couple minutes that you were spending with it that came to the foreground? Um, you know, and that's always, always neat to see. And then, um, you know, I'd ask you to also take a moment to look at that drawing that you just made and really consider it and consider if it sort of has the essence of the thing that you drew. So like what I mean by that is if we think about the money plant that was on the, the last exercise that we did, you know, the kind of essence of that to me is like those little, little circular discs sort of like fire working all around on the top held by this, you know, sort of big oval shape, right? So any drawing that sort of speaks to that, that sort of um, those two ideas, right? captures that essence of it. So again, as you look at your drawing, it might be something about the essence of the story. It was, you know, a joyful story. So you see that, um, or you kind of captured the physical essence of that thing. So that's another way to begin to evaluate your work rather than, was this the best drawing that's ever been made in the history of drawing? Um, I don't, I would argue that's not the most interesting question that you can ask. Um, so, uh, one last thing I'm going to, to offer to you guys today since we're sort of getting right, right up against the, the end of our, of our class time together and I want to leave a little time for questions if there are some. Um, I'm going to give you a piece of homework to do um, for these drawings. So I want you to title one of the drawings that you made today. And the reason I am suggesting this is that I am a big believer that by titling our work, um, we are giving it the respect uh, that it deserves because if we sort of took the time to, to come here today or, you know, come to our wherever we are being creative, um, if we took that time and we put that effort in, it deserves to be valued and, and given respect um, and, and it's worthy of that. So um, your title can be, you know, it can be something very straightforward like my mug. Um, or it could be, you know, something that speaks to the story of, of what you drew, or it could be something that only makes sense to you or anything. Um, but think about the way that title can kind of bring that piece to life even a little bit more and sort of connect you even more to the experience of, of the drawing or the thing that you were drawing. Um, and I will, um, heavily recommend that if you would like to share those drawings, I think you can send them directly to the MTA who will pass them on to me, uh, to the Transit Museum, they'll, they'll share them and you can just feel free to snap a photo and um, add your title to it. You can share it by email with them or find me on Instagram because I, I love nothing more than to see what people make and, and cheer you on. So please, please share. Um, and that is that brings us to the end of our of our little class drawing class here together. So hopefully you had a good time um, making a couple little drawings. And you know if this seems fun and you're enjoying this process and the way it kind of stitches you into your world, um, you know this is not something as you can see that requires millions of hours of, of prep or tons of, of talent or or you know skill. You can have this experience in just a few minutes. Um, of, of kind of tuning into your world and, and making creative sense of it. And when we do that, we're really adding a lot to the view. We're adding love and interest and joy and order and stories and empathy and curiosity and art. <laughs> um, so, and, and that's really an excellent thing to do. And um, 
I will finish this by saying, you know, this is my favorite sayings. Uh, if you can do the verb, you can claim the noun. So if you can make art, you are an artist. So after tonight, you have all made art. So you are all artists. <laughs> and I really can't wait to see what connections you make um, as you draw on your way. So thank you for, for letting me chat to you. And um, uh, if folks need to go, they can go. And otherwise, I'll, I'll, if you've got some questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really great to hear more about your past and how you got started and also have this really great time to try our own drawing together. Um, I know for myself, drawing a, a glass that I use every day, I've now seen more details on that glass, even though it's something in front of me all day, every day. So thank you for that. I can't wait to try some of these techniques on the subway next time I arrive. Um, so yes, here's all the information where you can find more about Sarah's book and find more about her project. Uh, follow her on social channels to learn more about um, all of the things that she talked a little bit about today. And I know there were a couple of things that came up in the chat. I saw one question that we could maybe start with, which was a little while back about um, how people respond. So have you had different responses to people giving you, uh, to, to you giving the drawings to people um, other than the woman that was wearing the fedora? What other kind of in the moment responses yeah. have you had? Yeah, I've, I've actually never had a bad response. Um, when I started sharing my drawings on the train, I was like, this very well could be the way that I die. Like this, like going up to a stranger and trying to explain what I've just done. Um, but I've I've only had, you know, wonderful, wonderful reactions. So and you know, sometimes it's 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 not much of a reaction. People are sort of like, oh, okay, thanks. Um, and other times it's it's, you know, oftentimes it is the the really memorable reactions to me are people saying some variation of, I was having a day where I didn't really feel worthy of being seen like by myself or anyone else and having somebody show me that um meant a lot and so that is i feel like that is that is who i'm always trying to reach is is people who it's like just need that reminder that we're all worthy so it's always always been good reactions shockingly I love it. That's great to hear. Um, we have a couple of other questions that have come up in the chat about um, you being an art history major. Uh, so your original passion was art before you went into music. Yeah. And then a follow up to that was, do you miss your music career? Yeah. Um, yes. So I was an art history major. I don't know what my what my plan was with that <laughs> when I did it. It has sneakily sort of come um, come into handy, very much handy, because it's sort of learning about the the art that's out there you get a sort of informal art education so i say i'm self-taught but i learned a lot about what makes good art by by studying it um even though i wasn't making it um and i think i also learned a lot about you know art history is it's art and history so you're learning about a culture and a time and a place through the art that was made in it and so i think that also sort of helped me see the way that art is is more again than just um a physical piece of creativity, it, it sort of speaks, it can speak to a lot more about what's going on. Um, so I think that, you know, that that was in there. Um, but I've always, always loved art and music. I sort of describe myself as a as a pretty talented third grader. So I like to sing and draw and write. Um, and I, I do miss my singing career sometimes. Um, I, I, I find ways to sing. I do musical improv um, in, in New York when we're able to do that together. <laughs> so that is super fun. And that, that's all the good stuff of singing without any of the preparation. So I, I have discovered I, I'm a very improvisatory person. I like, I like just showing up and playing. So <laughs> yeah. Um, and I love this question too. So what do you say to people when you give them your drawing? Like, how do you uh, initially start that verbal conversation? Yes. Um, I, I eventually over time, I, I, am surprisingly, was surprisingly shy. I'm a pretty like outgoing person, but when I would share these drawings, I always felt really shy. Um, in part, cause it's just sort of a confusing thing to explain to somebody like, hi, I drew you, you know? Um, and so I, I have, I should have had them here, but, um, I had little cards made that say, you are a work of art. Um, and when I give my drawing to somebody, I will sort of walk up to them as, as sort of gently as I can and share the drawing with that card on it. So sort of instantly people get a sense of like, not only that they've been drawn, but sort of the, the mission or the idea behind it. So that right away, it's like, 
this is a, this is something for you to support you, um, not to to make you feel uncomfortable or anything else that that I feel like people could could feel. So, yeah, the cards help a lot. They they help my my strange shyness in this regard and and sort of make it clear what what I'm hoping to share. I think. <laughs> I love that idea of having the prop to sort of help start the conversation. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, since this is the Transit Museum, uh, we cannot let someone go without asking your favorite train line, your favorite station, um, whether it was your own stop or just one that you really liked. Um, oh, gosh. Well, my favorite train is the F train. I actually thanked it in the thank you section of my book. <laughs> um, because truly, um, if I lived off of a more efficient train line, or if I hadn't lived in Brooklyn and commuted into New York or into Manhattan, um, that train, that train gave me a wonderful education and a lot of time to do it. So I love that train. Um, and my favorite station um, West Forth, because I always enjoy like just it's like the alphabet station. They're like, <laughs> you know, when they list all the trains that are there, I just I am always entertained by that. So West Forth. Excellent. I love it. Um, great. So we're getting we're getting toward the end of our time here. Um, I know that there are some other comments and questions in the chat, but um, you know, I think if you want to find Sarah on her social channels, you can follow her along that way and maybe learn a little bit more uh, through through her different channels. Um, I would love to invite everyone, if you're local, to visit us at the New York Transit Museum. We're open in downtown Brooklyn. We are also open at Grand Central Terminal at our annex there. And we have uh, an, an exhibit that actually relates to this called Transit Sketches. So, um, so if you'd like to join us and see that, it would be great to have you there. And the one last thing I'm going to share with you in the chat is a survey. Um, if anyone is able, if you have a couple of minutes to uh, look at a survey about our public programs, you can help us shape the next programs that we offer at the Transit Museum Online. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Sarah, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, it was really great to have you, and I look forward to following along and uh, seeing your journey in the future. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Thank you to everyone for joining as well. Thank no, you. thank you. <laughs> Thanks. My favorite train is the D. My favorite station is the 70 Avenue train. And I made this. <laughs>